Uh, hi, I would like to present to you uh, research and development of uh, a new generation of degraders, degrader molecules that affect activities of histone modifying enzymes. And what is the significance of uh, this approach? What is the promise of this approach? Uh, for basic research and also for uh, clinical, preclinical and clinical studies. And I would like to start from the introduction and the general subject of epigenetics and my personal, personal, professional, personal interest in epigenetics, uh, how I got interested in epigenetics initially. And um, I need to tell you the, briefly the story that it is um, originates from my PhD studies, of course. Uh, my PhD studies were devoted to uh, research on regulation of uh, potassium channels, voltage-regulated, uh, invert rectifier, and potassium channels, whatever potassium channels we have studied, the thus model organism or model cell uh, that um, were subject of my research, but in any case, uh, whatever specifically I was dealing with in my lab work and in my uh, lab projects, of course, uh, I was open to uh, see the progress, dramatic progress in the field, and what uh, the lab in which I worked, the lab of uh, Professor Bernard Atali, was uh, studying other things beyond the voltage-gated potassium channels in glial cells um, th that was subject of my research. So uh, very exciting uh, research was going on that time uh, uh, on uh, cardiac potassium channels. And, uh, they were studying different subunits, uh, trying to identify subunits of the channel, cardiac channel, uh, find uh, those, identify and characterize modulation of those uh, channels that are being mutated uh, and they were discovered to be mutated in uh, several uh, genetic disorders. And uh, of course, there is a very interesting and uh, clinically significant uh, syndrome that uh, was studied in, in, in the lab where I, where I did my uh, doctoral work was a long QT syndrome. Long QT uh, refers to cardiogram. Yeah, so uh, those abnormalities in cardiogram observed in mutations uh, in potassium channel in certain uh, residues in certain subunit, uh, not going into details of uh, KVL QT potassium channel and that was a very very hot subject and it is still is still hot subject of, of research but uh, since I was more inclined to genetics studies and was interested in genetics genetics in neuroscience genetics in molecular cell biology um, of course um, I got interested in uh, that particular area and uh, what I found that time, and it was uh, second half of 90s, that uh, that very channel, KVLQT channel, is an uh, imprinted gene. It is an uh, imprinted gene, uh, and it is imprinted uh, in most human fetal tissues, except for heart, and uh, in a, a long QT syndrome, there could be uh, certain uh, differences in uh, molecular regulation because of imprinting, because uh, this uh, uh, gene uh, lies in the imprinted region of the genome. Uh, so uh, I was uh, got more and more interested in that subject, uh, just like a side project, not the project for lab work, but uh, of a project of uh, my uh, um, interest as biologist. And um, of course, uh, 
uh, that channel KVLQT KCNA9 it is a maternally expressed gene encoding in potassium channel and mutations invoke in cardiac arrhythmia uh, and the translocations maternal translocation are observed in genetic syndrome that is called beckwith widman syndrome beckwith widman syndrome uh, was and still is subject of uh, uh, investigation by molecular geneticist uh, and uh, now it is uh, much better understood and characterized than uh, uh, 20 years ago let's say so um, interesting uh, that um, i was uh, got interested in uh, imprinting and epigenetics in general and uh, um, functions of those uh, processes in development and also relevance to disease and of course uh, disease uh, they are talking about cancers first of all but uh, of course uh, because of those mutations in potassium channels it is very much uh, relevant for cardiac arrhythmias and uh, for heart disease yeah uh, so mechanisms of imprinting i got a talk lecture on that subject uh, being a student uh, in uh, neurobiology department in Weizmann Institute I, I, I gave a lecture on that subject because it was very very interesting for me um, and of course uh, I was interested in mechanisms of imprinting and those uh, include that differential patterns of DNA methylation on uh, and in uh, during embryogenesis that's what was you know, during development how it changes was very interesting for me in uh, maternal and paternal uh, copies of the genes and uh, this is the basic for imprinting um, uh, how this is uh, passed to over cell uh, division uh, from uh, uh, germ uh, line and how it is uh, passed in stem cells uh, this is very interesting so, and still interesting and uh, hot subjects of research um, about the imprint and genome it is important to realize that those imprint and genes form clusters so they are located closely to each other in certain regions of the genome and uh, it was uh, before the sequencing uh, was uh, fully established of the whole genome so now, of course, it is much, much, much better understood. But it was a, a, a region uh, under very, very uh, hot investigation uh, by uh, several laboratories. And I visited a leading laboratory in United States studying genomic imprinting. Uh, visited a lab of uh, Professor Shirley Tillman in um, department of uh, molecular biology in princeton university um, because uh, she was and is a, a well known a famous world expert in imprinting in molecular mechanism of imprinting and it was before she made her fantastic uh, career as science administrator and uh, uh, it was just before before all those uh, size administration uh, changes in her in her own career and uh, i was just interested in research nothing else and uh, it was coming from potassium channels uh, it is uh, very obvious and clear where it comes from my my interest in this subject of research uh, so of course uh, then uh, there was uh, many many different discoveries and contributions uh, on the mechanisms of uh, epigenetic uh, uh, epigenetic mechanisms uh, identifying subunits of chromatin modifying complexes characterizing uh, modifications of histones histone proteins uh, on, on various residues and various by various modification what we know now as classical histone code 
So uh, their contribution by uh, very well recognized. Um, and of course, uh, David Ellis uh, ma made a f very significant contribution to this area. Um, I was uh, in contact recently with Andrew Feinberg, uh, who studied epigenetic mechanisms in cancer and regulation of uh, uh, cancer-related genes, uh, tumor suppressors and oncogens by epigenetic mechanisms. And uh, he uh, kindly provided me with a recent review on epigenetic modulators, modifiers, and mediators in cancer etiology and progression. Uh, very, very interesting review in Nature Review Genetics uh, that uh, they published on that subject. So it is, and it was, and it is very uh, promising and serious subject of research. Uh, of course, because of the mechanisms of cancerogenesis that have been discovered to be uh, regulation of cancer stem cells uh, and um, because of the drugs that uh, uh, were discovered over the past decade or so that are effective in cancers and uh, in general histone uh, modif modulating drugs are effective and uh, first of all we are talking about histone deacetylases uh, so those drugs were shown to be effective and that's uh, that's why uh, there is a great interest uh, in, in that area of research of course uh, uh, today now i'm speaking on very specific uh, uh, new development in this area a new application a new technology that became available recently and is very very promising for basic research and also for preclinical studies and uh, this is the subject that I would like to present to you now. And um, briefly, uh, let me say, I would like to make the, to tell you about the classification of uh, histone deacetylases, uh, mentioning histone uh, acetyltransferases, those uh, enzymes that add or remove acetyl groups uh, to uh, lysine residues, specific lysine residues in histone proteins. Um, introducing you to the subject of epigenetic regulators, uh, their uh, uh, in importance of uh, those regulators for epigenetics of aging, now also very hot subject of research and a very promising direction of research in a recent decade. Uh, uh, also mentioning uh, non-histone substrate of deacetylases uh, because deacetylases uh, remove acetyl groups not only from histone proteins but from non-histone proteins and that is also a very important consideration uh, we need to consider complexes multi-protein complexes and subunits of those complexes have been identified and characterized also, there is an um, important insight into those enzymes and modulation of those enzymes comes from genetic studies, and those are knockout studies in a transgenic organism. First of all, mice, of course. First of all, uh, we are talking about transgenic mice, knockout studies. And uh, then I'll briefly mention uh, um, the area of investigation what uh, are HDIC inhibitors uh, molecular cellular mechanism of actions of action of HDIC inhibitors uh, what is the, the me molecular mechanism what is the cellular mechanism of action and uh, also um, introduce to the area of preclinical and clinical use of these inhibitors because uh, they are being used very very actively in ongoing studies and uh, i'm not a pharmacologist and never work for pharmaceutical company but of course uh, it's not the secret uh, that those 
uh, reagents uh, are targets for developing new drugs and successful targets. So um, then I introduce you to molecular glues and molecular degraders, new generation of molecular agents that specifically target uh, various uh, proteins, including uh, histone-modifying proteins. Uh, then uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, class 1 HDAC degrader, HDAC 6 degraders, uh, degraders targeting uh, uh, not dependent density lasers, uh, non-selective uh, reagents, um, also touching upon the subject of other histone-modifying enzymes, not only acety deacetylases, but other histone-modifying enzymes. Uh, of course, um, as molecular biologist, I'm interested in molecular mechanisms and cellular effects, and this is what I'm more, much more interested myself in is, but uh, I think um, generally we need to consider all those uh, important uh, points, uh, and those who study uh, those things need to be aware of the progress in all these areas. Uh, so uh, then I'll speak about testing HDAC degraders and present some open questions and perspectives in developing this new generation of uh, compounds that specifically target this very promising uh, class of uh, molecular modulators. And um, uh, in the end, I, I would make an update on uh, some uh, recent studies just, just published that I myself think are more exciting and interesting and relevant to that area of investigation. So that's my introduction. And now let me uh, tell you uh, the story. So uh, when we are uh, considering HDAC, histone deacetyl deacetylases, they are classified human enzymes. Consist, uh, family. It is a family of enzymes. Consists of 18 enzymes. 11 of those contain divalent zinc cation in the catalytic site. And the remaining seven uh, are sirtuins. So sirtuins, that means that the NAD plus dependent deacetylases. Uh, HDACs uh, cl are classified into four classes. Class 1, HDAC 1, 2, 3, and 8. Class 2, 8, HDAC 4, 5, 7, and 9. Class 2B, HDAC 6 and 10. Class 4, HDAC 11. And class 3, sirtuins, uh, uh, NAD plus dependent histone deacetylases. Uh, HDACs deacetylate lysine residues in the end termini of uh, histones, and we are talking about H3 and H4 histones. Uh, the, those, uh, we can mention those modifications. There are several different modifications. They are all very well characterized using antibodies uh, specific to mo modified residue within uh, uh, histones. Uh, uh, histone-free uh, lysine 9 acetylation, histone-free lysine 27 acetylation among best known and studied and uh, more important possibly because of their biological function. Dynamic regulation of acetylation deacetylation uh, is maintained by histone deacetylases and histone acetyl transferases heads and they counteract each other. There is a certain balance of acetylation-deacetylation reaction 
uh, HDACs function uh, in the histone surrounding nucleosomes, cause compact chromatin conformation. Compact chromatin uh, is not accessible to RNA polymerase, activators of gene expression, transcription factors, enhancers, and that compaction of chromatin results in suppression of transcription of the target genes. Opposite to function of deacetylases, acetyltransferases recruited to activator complexes uh, acetylate histones, leading to open chromatin conformation and activation of transcription by RNA polymerases. Uh, now, mm, need to mention uh, important uh, area of investigation, epigenetics of aging and uh, uh, role of epigenetics in uh, biology of aging. Uh, fantastic progress was uh, achieved over recent years. I don't want to mention specific laboratory, even the review articles were published already by leading journals on that subject of research. Uh, don't want to mention some, somebody specifically, but uh, obviously uh, area of very hot investigation and uh, uh, important discoveries. HDACs function on heterochromatin. They maintain inactive inert state. Uh, so mm, in terms of uh, role of acetylases, deacetylases in aging. Of course, we first of all need to mention uh, classical, canonical gene and protein, SIR2. SIR2 is a NAD activated deacetylase, as we all now know, master regulator of longevity, studied in model organism in East, uh, it deacetylase and termini of histone leads to uh, inactive heterochromatin state and gene silencing. Loss of CER2 shortens replicative lifespan uh, in yeast, of course, and then uh, it was uh, studied in other model organisms. Overexpression and the small molecule activators of CER2 extend lifespan. So this is the canonical classical gene discovered many years ago and uh, this is where uh, history of discoveries on, in this field originates from, from those studies. So studies in model organisms show that uh, caloric restriction and starvation are accompanied by increase in histone deacetylase activity. So there is a kind of pathway. So uh, there is a stimulus and re response. Stimulus is caloric restriction, or starvation, uh, lack of amino acids and other nutrients. And uh, the output is increased activity of uh, certain specific histone deacetylases on specific gene. And that suggests that in response to nutritional stress, global deacetylation serves to protect cells and uh, influence aging. And of course, um, uh, researchers who study uh, those, uh, we need uh, to mention uh, Lenny Garenta, uh, Cynthia Kenyon, uh, David Sinclair, and many other researchers uh, who made very, very significant contribution, don't dare here to mention those who made significant discoveries, uh, just not the idea of this talk. In East, starvation is mimicked uh, by rapamycin. Rapamycin is an inhibitor of TORSI1 complex. Uh, and uh, that treatment uh, with rapamycin uh, displaces RNA polymerase from rDNA lossing, inhibits transcription in those sites. rDNA silencing is facilitated by increased binding of 
the HDAC complex and that complex is RPD free syn free HDAC complex RPD free uh, and deacetylation of histones uh, histone uh, H4 on uh, certain lysine residues so that complex RPD free syn free uh, H HDAC complex I happen to study uh, to learn about that complex many years ago while I worked in Canada on a model fungus for which we had gene expression data and uh, genome sequencing data and experimental data on secretion and some cell biology data so it was already obvious for me uh, in the beginning of 2000s that RPD3 uh, syn HDC complex of course the conserved uh, complex uh, at least uh, among fungi and yeast that um, it, it plays very very important role and uh, repressive chromatin effects of rapamycin serve to lower transcription of and of protein synthesis apparatus and reduces growth so obviously uh, it's uh, rapamycin uh, uh, suppresses growth and tor pathway uh, is a growth path right Epigenetic transgenerational effect of histone deacetylases are under active investigation. Uh, of course, uh, epigenetic transgenerational uh, inheritance is also very hot subject of research. I never worked personally uh, yet in that area, but uh, I'm aware of studies and uh, were fantastic, very, very attractive studies published over the past decade on that subject uh, there is a there are laboratories uh, experts in this field um, there is a laboratory in tel aviv university uh, studying uh, in uh, transgenerational inheritance and epigenetic mechanisms of uh, uh, transgenerational inheritance uh, there is a laboratory in Switzerland, in Zurich, uh, of uh, Professor Isabel Mansur. And there are um, other, other laboratories in the world studying those things. V very, very interesting molecular studies on the uh, impact of uh, early development and the passing of certain traits, uh, stress, eff effects, of, transgenerational effects of the uh, earlier life stress uh, unfortunately my own personal life experience happened to be relevant for that subject of research even though I never subjected myself or my close relatives to molecular tests but uh, uh, it happened that those who move from country to country um, experience those kinds of stresses that are very much relevant for that area of investigation for transgenerational effects of uh, uh, epigenetic in, in epigenetic inheritance so here i need to mention uh, just briefly that in females inactive x chromosome uh, has under acetylated histones well x another x chromosome is active with many uh, histones being acetylated in males status of uh, y chromosome histone acetylation needs to be uh, more detailed uh, studied or I, I need to learn myself more about what is already known and uh, again uh, never try to uh, focus on uh, on those things specifically just realize how important it is interesting that hdc inhibitors cause increased histone acetylation and activation of genes in inactive x chromosome so uh, what we uh, think about it we think that possible hdc inhibitors affect gene expression on uh, sex chromosomes it is quite possible 
Yeah. So you need to be very careful about uh, uh, investigating uh, consequences of using those drugs for next generations. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I, I didn't work in pharmaceutical, as I mentioned, so uh, not very much uh, uh, familiar with regulation process in the companies, uh, how rigorously they study transgenerational effects, but obviously effect on uh, act inactivation, uh, histone uh, modification of sex chromosome is a very important thing. Now, beyond uh, modification of the histones, H3, H4 histones, the uh, histone code, of modification, um, HDACs function outside the nucleus, so they modify uh, not only, uh, they remove uh, acetyl groups not only from ly lysine residues on the histone proteins, but also on non-histone substrate proteins outside of the nucleus. And uh, those enzymes, they are localized not only in the nucleus, and uh, we need to consider specifically individual each protein, each gene, uh, each protein and, uh, within HDACs families, where they are located within the cell. Uh, because there are substrates uh, beyond nuclear substrates, uh, histones, and histone modifying protein complexes. For example, HDAC6 deacetylates heat shock protein HSP90 uh, and also components of microtubule network. And uh, the, of course, uh, those components we need to mention alpha tubulin and beta tubulin. So both alpha tubulin and beta tubulin have been studied in terms of modifications. Uh, activities of HDACs point to important functions of HDAC regulated microtubules, cytoskeleton remodeling in cell division, cell migration, chaperone signaling. So, since uh, these enzymes affect modification of microtubule and cytoskeletal proteins, there are consequences of uh, modulating those activities on cell division, cell migration, and other cytoskeleton and microtubule dependent functions within the cell. Trafficking of the proteins on, and micromolecules. So uh, uh, it is also relevant for stress responses. As I mentioned, HSP90. H heat shock protein HSP90 uh, is deacetylated. Uh, so uh, for that reason, it is very uh, important for heat shock responses as well. Histone acetylation uh, was shown to be regulated by cell cycle progression. And uh, not only that, uh, depending on the phase of the cell cycle, there are differences in uh, histone um, acetylation, but also vice versa, reciprocal uh, influence, HDC inhibitors might affect tumor suppressor genes and cause cell cycle arrest. Uh, um, and that is their mechanism of action is based on that. One of the, the possible mechanisms of action is that they cause cell cycle arrest. So we see that uh, it is a complex. On the one hand, uh, modifications change over cell cycle and being regulated over cell cycle in different phases. On the other hand, if we block this modification, it uh, may uh, cause cell cycle arrest. And obviously, the mechanism in, is, in wool is linked to cell cycle progression. Non-enzymatic functions of HDIC are not uh, so well understood. Uh, mm, uh, of course, uh, uh, beyond histones, 
we need to consider that there are uh, multi-protein complexes and scaffolding, uh, large multi-protein complexes. And HDACs interact with numerous uh, other proteins. They interact with transcription factors and regulate activity of transcription factors. Uh, Non-enzymatic functions uh, need to be further investigated. So, of course, uh, mostly studies focused on uh, modifying uh, histones. So, we need to consider all other uh, functions of HDACs as well to understand their biological actions. So, there are molecules and this new generation of molecules that may downregulate protein levels, but they don't affect activity of the enzyme, enzymatic activity. So the uh, compounds uh, now under development uh, are not uh, trying to affect acti enzymatic activity of HDACs, but they, uh, their uh, purpose is to downregulate protein levels of those enzymes. Now, let's consider uh, histone-modifying multiprotein complexes. Typically, canonical histone-modifying complexes consist of several elements. It is targeting subunit that interacts with DNA-binding proteins. It is a histone-modifying enzyme, which is either histone acetyltransferase or histone deacetylase. And third component is a factor subunit that acts on a chromatin. So HDAC is recruited and becomes component of a co-repressor complex responsible for repression of transcription. And uh, uh, there is a DNA binding subunit, co-repressor and HDAC. So what are examples of such complexes? Let's. Uh, give a few examples of such complexes. HDAC corepressor complexes uh, uh, include MIO-D, MADMAX heterodimer, SMRT, MECP2, that is very, very important uh, gene and protein because of the mutation in, in RAT syndrome, polycomb repressive complexes, uh, and uh, this is, uh, for example, enhancer of SESTE, EZH2, containing repressor complexes, uh, studied in Drosophila and now in many other organisms, uh, not only in Drosophila, but in other organisms as well. Histone binding protein, HDAC. So, interesting example of regulation in uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae regulation of GAL1, GAL10 system. Uh, yeah, this involves methylation of histones, uh, histone 3 on lysine 36. Uh, uh, it is demethylation and trimethylation of target genes, uh, meaning GAL1 and GAL10. And this leads to recruitment of HDC and histone deacetylase, resulting in activation of expression of those genes. So, genetic studies, let's consider genetic studies and uh, insight in this area of investigation from genetic studies. Genetic studies are, first of all, knockout studies with knockout mice. Uh, there is a review article, for example, that a recent uh, review article by Daniel Anankar Rodriguez and colleagues and present, uh, discusses important information on uh, translational significance of examining phenotype of mice uh, that have knockouts in individual histone deacetylase genes. And uh, what we learn from those studies is that um, uh, those inhibitors that are under development and being tested now, 
we need to be very cautious on the safety issues that those need those safety questions need to be very very carefully examined no doubt that uh, pharmaceutical companies very seriously invest and consider those issues but we need to be very careful uh, besides the regulation process and uh, acceptance of those drugs by governmental agencies but just need to be careful as biologists trying to understand possible uh, important roles placed by individual NG HDCs in embryonic and postnatal development because of the functions of those genes in embryonic and postnatal development and because epigenetics plays such important role over development uh, all the attempts to manipulate those genes might have consequences for development of the organism so need to consider those things carefully it is important for drug development because uh, could be teratogenic effects of HTC inhibitors because of the functions of HTC in development targeting certain HDACs might exclude use in pregnant women or those who may be pregnant so important to consider immunomodulation metabolic other functions of HDAC genes so what we learn from knockout studies it is important realization that certain enzymes for example HDAC6 and the uh, knockout of HDAC6 it is relevant for uh, neurodegenerative diseases including Alzheimer disease inflammation cancer metastasis uh, and uh, while studying those effects we need to consider not only uh, effect on gene expression via histone modi modification but also non-histone functions of HDC6 because of the possible effects on cell migration uh, and, in, uh, and uh, it, uh, it, uh, the effect that was observed by uh, the group in uh, Singapore the group in Singapore studies uh, increase hyperacetylation of beta tubulin and effect on cell migration and there is an interesting study by Ixin Su uh, laboratory in uh, Singapore on that subject of research now uh, let me introduce the class of drugs known as HDAC inhibitors important insights into functions of HDAC come from use of HDAC inhibitors so what we know about uh, those enzymes comes from the study of inhibitors to a great extent initial studies uh, were with compound uh, that uh, have been discovered to have inhibitory activity on deacetylase enzymes and among uh, very well understood and studied compounds we need to mention trihostatin A and butyric acid and those uh, uh, compounds were used in experimental studies ex extensively so biologists studying epigenetics use them those compounds quite widely inhibit uh, application of such inhibitors in yeast leads to accumulation of histone acetylated nucleosomes and the activation of gene expression they also cause acetylation of centromeric heterochromatin use of inhibitor may cause epigenetic effects uh, and we need to keep in mind possible transgenerational effects so that acetylated state of histone uh, may be passed to the next generation of the cells following cell division and the possible epigenetic transgenerational effects of HDC inhibitors on humans uh, uh, are unknown 
So we need to be careful about it. And I'm sure that those who study those effects do it rigorously and very seriously, but we need to be aware in principle to be aware of that problem. Molecular cellular mechanism of action of uh, HDC inhibitors. Um, considering molecular and cellular mechanism, let me tell you that for me as biologist, this is what is most curious is molecular cellular mechanism. Because uh, I'm more interested how modifications of proteins affect gene expression, function, biological functions. That is just for me much more interesting than, than other things. Uh, but it is my personal bias. Right, uh, because of my curiosity and uh, functions of en how enzymes work and what their eff effects and functions are. Uh, inhibitors are thought to function as acetylation, deacetylation specific epigenetic regulators. The effect also, as I mentioned previously, quite a few times, non-histone substrates outside the nucleus, such as tubulin and heterotrophic proteins. And uh, HDC-specific uh, uh, reagents are being developed, uh, uh, known as uh, protein-targeting chimeras, chimeras, protax. And those uh, mm, uh, reagents, they are based on engineering uh, ubiquitin ligase being targeted to substrate, target protein to be degraded, that is degraded through proteasome, right? So they, uh, those products might affect also non-catalytic functions uh, of HDAC because they just downregulate protein wherever this protein is located. So if a compound can reach target protein inside the nucleus or outside the nucleus, it might um, uh, downregulate the, the protein and affect all the functions of that protein. A therapeutic epigenetic mechanism of HDC inhibitors is thought to be significantly enhanced by use of combination with demethylating agents. And here, of course, we are talking about uh, histone code. So it is potentiated because of those interplay between different modifications of the same protein. Uh, so uh, reagents that is uh, being used for those studies effectively, for example, is 5-aza-deoxycytidine, azacytidine, and mechanism is based on uh, the observation that HDAC is recruited to proteins binding methylated cytosines so preventing both binding of the complex to target genes and inhibiting activity is thought to enhance the effect on expression of target genes in terms of uh, cellular mechanism of action also subject of very active investigation uh, observed cellular effects include arrest of the cell differentiation, uh, cell cycle progression, something that I previously mentioned, cellular senescence, and apoptosis. Since cellular senescence falling out of the cell cycle, uh, when cells stop to proliferate, is uh, linked to cell cycle progression, the arrest of the cell cycle, uh, all those uh, functions, all those uh, biological effects uh, are possible effects of using those inhibitors. Apoptosis, uh, programmed cell death, is also a very important uh, output of, of those uh, cell, the observed cellular effect of using those drugs. On the molecular level, uh, what is important uh, mechanism, how it all works, we need to consider very carefully and keep into account, keep in mind uh, 
uh, that uh, uh, accumulation of reactive oxygen species happens under various biological conditions, stresses, stress conditions, then cells are stressed out. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, reactive oxygen species is a very important uh, group of um, uh, compounds that we need to examine and keep in mind that those affect downstream events within the cell. DNA damage response, disruption of chaperons and the chaperon signaling. Histonacetylation, deacetylation affects expression of tumor suppressor genes. And uh, I just mentioned uh, in the beginning of my talk that I had a brief communication uh, with um, one of the leading uh, biologists who studied those things with Andrew Feinberg, and he gave recently a talk in the Weizmann Institute Cancer Club on his work, and I kindly requested and he sent me his review article. Uh, yes, tumor suppressor genes and uh, oncogenes, they are under control of epigenetic mechanism. So activation of tumor suppressor genes leads to cell cycle arrest and apoptosis. And those uh, are mechanisms relevant for cellular senescence as well. So that's why HDAC inhibitors are senolytic drugs. Yeah, senolytic drugs. HDACs participate in DNA repair and uh, depletion by RNAi of specific inhibitors lead to increase YH2AX expression, heightened DNA damage response. They modulate response to therapy-induced genotoxic stress uh, and therapy-induced senescence. So senescence is triggered by various biological uh, and uh, pharmaceutical stimuli, including drugs, uh, and the very well-known phenomenon of uh, drug-induced senescence. So drugs such as Vorinostat, panhistone deacetylase inhibitor, and is potential uh, therapy-inducing senescent drug. And it, uh, one of the, uh, the effect of using those drugs is uh, impact on DNA damage response. Vorinostat alters the normal chromatin structure HDC inhibitors might be among promising senolytic drugs, as I mentioned. This is a distinct class of senolytics under development now, these days. Uh, with all possible uh, future application open for investigation in the future, how HDC inhibitors can be used uh, as senolytics. Now, um, preclinical and clinical use of inhibitors. Inhibitors uh, uh, have been approved, several inhibitors have been approved for clinical studies. And uh, there are new candidates uh, under development. Uh, and they have been tested uh, successfully quite in numerous pathologies. And uh, those are various classes of diseases, it's uh, various cancers, several immune disorders and autoimmune disorders and neurological disorders. So mm, those compounds are active in modulating inflammation and autoimmune disorders, including asthma. In 2020, US Food and Drug Administration approved HDC inhibitors for treating cancers, and uh, we need to mention here very important class of diseases, lymphomas and myelomas and leukemias. So uh, approval of these drugs was achieved for T-cell lymphoma, multiple myeloma, acute myeloid leukemia. So those compounds undergo trials for treatment of also of solid cancer, 
including prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, head and neck cancer. Uh, so those conditions like NSCLC, HNSCC. Uh, this is promising class of drugs. So uh, whatever these oncologists uh, think about it, on what experience they have in everyday life on testing, on applying uh, those uh, drugs in clinical work. Potential use of inhibitors in neurological and neurodegenerative diseases is also very promising. And there are review articles recently published just on that subject of research. So it's a, a lot of work is going on, on that, including Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. And the progress was revealed by Rodriguez uh, very recently. So um, inhibitors, HDAC inhibitors could be non-selective and selective. So those are non, that are non-selective or pan-HDAC inhibitors, they affect several enzymes at once while applied. And selective, they are selective. So they are selective for HDAC3 or HDAC4 or HDAC6. Uh, such inhibitors as varinostat, this is non-selective inhibitor, uh, subaraneoxidoxymic acid uh, or SAHA, uh, dacinostat, they target class 1 and class 2b, HDAC 1, 2, 3, 6, 8 and 10. And there are other compounds. Um, TMP269, NDS HD1, targeting uh, other classes of HDAC. So I don't want to get into specific because uh, I have no experience and no that much interest in, in uh, trying to understand differences and selectivities of those compounds. It's just not my area of interest, expertise, and also not an area of my knowledge. Most important application, of course, among all those that I have mentioned, are oncology applications. Yes, oncology. In oncology, uh, this is very promising class of uh, anti-cancer drugs. Varinostat, ramidepsin, bilinostat, used in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, CTCL, Peripheral T-cell lymphoma, acute myeloid leukemia. So those, of course, are very, very harsh conditions, uh, very, very dangerous, and uh, often with bad prognosis. And uh, if this uh, class of drugs can relieve uh, condition, patient conditions and uh, be effective, uh, we need to consider it very, very carefully uh, in all possible aspects of uh, 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 trying to treat patients suffering from those diseases with these compounds. Panabinostat, used for treatment of multiple myeloma. HDAC inhibitors also are tested in solid cancer, as I mentioned. Uh, and uh, there are um, combination of drugs being used, and this is very promising in uh, cancer biology and in, in pharmaceuticals, trying to combine several types of classes of drugs in a single treatment protocol. For example, global aurora kinase inhibition, inhibitors of aurora kinases, are combined with HDC inhibitors, and this results in uh, effect on senescence, upregulates senescence in the prostate cancer uh, models. So what is the idea of upregulation of senescence? It is like a two-step process that uh, uh, was described by uh, experts in senescence, those who study cellular senescence, uh, quite a while ago, they realized that uh, senolytics could be very promising 
in cancer treatment that it could be set two rounds of treatment let's say uh, trying first to uh, shift proliferating cancer cells those cancer stem cells into senescent state non proliferate using senolytics and then using uh, chemotherapy trying to eliminate those uh, remaining non dividing cells that's the idea uh, panabenostat was investigated for potential uh, uh, to treat uh, lung head neck cancer cells uh, and induce them into senescent state uh, by cisplatin and uh, paclitaxel in vitro chemotherapy induced senescent tumor cells uh, were more vulnerable to effects of panobinostat in comparison to proliferating counterparts so again they, i just mentioned st certain study here it's uh, sam samaravira uh, at all 2017 but the idea is again idea i already uh, tried to present here the idea is that make cancer cell vulnerable to anti uh, to uh, drugs that may kill them and uh, th this is the idea of using senolytics making them more vulnerable so uh, Synalytics uh, activity of panabinostat linked to effect on uh, expression of uh, mitochondrial uh, regulators such as BCLXL. So this is uh, from BCL group of uh, apoptotic anti-apoptotic proteins, also very important target. For drug development uh, so mitochondria mediated uh, apoptosis is linked to those activities just mentioned above and, uh, and when we consider effects of uh, their situation inhibitors we need to consider possibly effects on pro-apoptotic apoptotic proteins including those mitochondrial proteins huh. they are also tested in use in certain autoimmune diseases including asthma and it's important that effects of histonacetylation deacetylation in immune responses uh, very very canonical classical uh, pathway is response to septic shock and bacteria to endotoxin right i myself uh, started my graduate studies in hebrew university from examining effect of endotoxin a lipopolysaccharide on uh, steroid receptors on expression of steroid receptors in the immune cell and uh, it, it is it was it is it will be very important area of investigation uh, how it all works and now we know much much more about lps signaling compared to what we knew 20 or 30 years ago <laughs> so how it all relate to hdacs gram negative uh, endotoxin causes inflammation and the release of inflammatory cytokines uh, and this is the molecular basics of septic shock res response uh, release of cytokines pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, such as tnf alpha and others the, the classical uh, interleukin and the cytokines increase in activity of histone acetyl transferases that's what happened and suppression of activities of HDAC so uh, overall there is increase in histone acetylation and activation of the genes responsible for anti-inflammatory immune response so opposite to that 
uh, steroids such as glucocorticoids, of course, uh, uh, need to mention dexamethasone first of all. Uh, steroids act, function through the, exert some of their function through histone deacetylases. Yes, and uh, they affect activity of steroid hormones through steroid receptors, of course, affect activities of histone deacetylases, for example, HDC2, and they suppress expression of pro-inflammatory genes. And that is an important molecular mechanism of action of steroid hormones. Right? So preclinical trials of HDC-specific senolytics. So I was talking quite a lot about senolytics. Let me just mention briefly uh, some specific examples here, coming back to senolytics. Modulators of therapy-induced senescence include uh, such uh, compounds as sodium butyrate, class 1 and uh, 2 HDC inhibitor, trihastatin A, class 1 and class 2 HDC inhibitor, MS-275, class 1 HDC inhibitor, varinostat, or SAHA, class 1 and class 2 HDC inhibitor, panabinostat, or LBH589 class 1, class 2 HDS inhibitor, 4 phenylbutyric acid class 1 uh, and 2A HDS inhibitor, valproic acid class 1 and uh, 2A HDS inhibitor. Um, also, again, I already mentioned that it is more powerful approach combination treatment kinase inhibitors and HDC inhibitors together. And uh, those induce, uh, in combination with Aurora kinase inhibitors, there is induction of senescence in prostate cancer cells, in lung, head and, uh, head and neck cancer. They induce senescence. So, uh, and then cells uh, are hopefully the idea is to clear the cells then. Uh, now I would like to present to you what I'm much more interested myself in uh, these days. And this is Protax, protein targeting chimeras and molecular glues. Uh, these are bivalent and monovalent degrader molecules. Of course, uh, I don't dare here to make a lecture on those compounds because it would take uh, two hours lectures just uh, to comprehensively introduce into this new and very, very uh, promising and uh, uh, like a golden mine, a new rash, uh, Alaska rash. <laughs> for uh, golden rush for those uh, drugs is now in both uh, academic laboratories in chemical biology laboratories uh, in United States and all over the world and also in pharmaceutical companies, of course. So I don't try to join that uh, golden rush now, uh, whatever it could mean. Uh, but uh, it is important to introduce this class of molecules. We provide primer that is very, very concise and uh, on protein targeting chimeras and uh, monovalent molecular glues degraders. Those types of compounds uh, were reviewed in many publications in leading journals, in chemical journals, in biology journals, in leading biology journals, in cell press journals, wherever you can find them, in chemistry, uh, spe specialized publication of chemical societies, and so on. So, recent publications and presentations, there are a series of conferences, uh, international conferences on that subject. There are uh, 
web webinars, a series of webinars on that subject. And I'm very, very grateful to Dana Farber Cancer Institute for organizing a series of fantastic uh, webinars, lectures by leading researchers studying those class of molecules and making it freely available to researchers around the world, including myself. And I was kindly uh, got uh, invitation to each individual and all of the talks uh, in this series of lectures. And it's enlightening, enlightening to learn on about the progress in this area from those leading laboratories. Uh, this series of lectures were organized by uh, Fisher Laboratory uh, in Dana Farber Institute. Uh, and uh, in addition to Fisher Laboratory, and I, I had no chance to visit Boston and uh, to be introduced in person to those people, but obviously I know them online very well and uh, their presentation, their work, their passion and motivation uh, to do research is just uh, fantastic. Um, there is a group uh, from which I initially learned about this subject, and this is a, a Seoul uh, group in University of Dundee. Uh, uni uh, and uh, this is very, very, very... Uh, there is an institute, the whole institute now, working in University of Dundee on that subject of research, on molecular degrader and protein targeting chimeras. So, uh, this is from them that I initially got interested in that subject of research. Uh, and uh, their fantastic online uh, journal club, I had access to their journal clubs and can learn about progress in protein targeting chimeras from uh, this University of Dundee in Scotland. Uh, uh, so very, very grateful to them uh, for those opportunities. Current product clinical trial focus on compounds targeting uh, such important classes of molecules as androgen receptor, developed drugs against prostate cancer, and estrogen receptor, developed drug against breast cancer. So previously, a brom domain proteins, important class of uh, uh, targets, molecular targets is uh, brom domain proteins, epigenetic readers uh, that uh, target acetylated uh, enzymes and uh, they uh, have been uh, targeted uh, by chemists, chemical biologists for a very long time. So it was realized that uh, this is very important and promising class of molecular targets and it was explored and uh, many, many studies uh, were published already on uh, those uh, brom domain pro pro epigenetic regulators. Um, individual molecules are being tested for their activities at protein target degree or libraries of the compounds. Uh, so it is possible to, uh, to use individual molecules tied, tailored for specific application, or we can screen for the libraries of compounds for their activity. And this is what how those studies go. Uh, degraders uh, relevant for what we discussed today include class 1 HDAC degrader, HDAC 6 degrader, and degrader targeting NAD plus activated uh, or sirtuins that acetylases. And also degraders for non-selective HDACs, non-selective HDAC degrader that target possibly more than one uh, protein. So, we briefly mentioned several recent examples of those degraders here. Class one HDAC degrader, HDAC one specific degrader based on DTAG system. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, degradation of fusion protein between F36V uh, uh, FKBP ligand and uh, 
derivative, uh, immediate derivative. So there's a uh, Mabit uh, uh, work, then Barcelona and Cruz published on that subject of research. In addition to HDC1, HDC3 specific degrader uh, reported uh, recently in 2020. So those compounds uh, use uh, certain E3 ubiquitin ligase to target for degradation the target protein and they use typically either cereblon or VHL. Those are most co commonly used ubiquitin ligases in these degrader compounds. And they tested them for breast cancer cell lines, HDC3 degradation, histone acetylation, cell proliferation. So various activities have been tested. Uh, compound may be promising target for breast cancer and uh, including uh, attempts to target metastasis of breast cancer. Uh, so anti-metastatic effects uh, is difficult to study. And uh, of course there are models, cellular models or animal models of metastasis so that requires uh, cancer biology laboratory uh, to study on in in model uh, in in animals like in in in, in mice and in my study in mice those uh, types of effects and it's quite difficult to study those metastatic effects anti metastatic effects in 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 the lab uh, Next class of degraders is HDAC6 degrader. Uh, work was published in 2018 and was first report on developing HDAC6 degrade. It's a relatively non-selective inhibitors used uh, and uh, they try to use cell-based assay and selected for uh, in cell-based assay selected for activities which is specific for HDC6. Uh, identifying one promising compound uh, that was increasing acetylation of, on, on the histone H3. And they noticed that inhibitors uh, may modulate acetylation of non-histone proteins. So uh, exactly what I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, uh, this is what they found using uh, this uh, uh, HDC inhibitor, um, uh, meaning that it has uh, possibly effect on tubulin and HSP90. So uh, possibly it will be some follow-up on non-histone functions. So uh, in trying to understand molecular mechanism, how the drug w uh, works through uh, follow-up study of non-histone substrate of acetylation. Uh, so that initial report, they then followed up and they used uh, cerebellum ligands in cell-based assays. They used binding assays and um, degradation, detected degradation of the acetylase in their assay using Western blot and mass spectrometry. So advantage of the system is that it is based on analysis of endogenous target of substrate protein. So it is those uh, experimental paradigms are not based on overexpressing artificially some proteins. They deal with endogenous levels of expression, just trying to affect endogenously expressed protein using these compounds. So also report selective HDC6 degrader nexturostat cereblon and it targets histones and the cytoplasmic substrates of HDC. Again, we see how significant are non-histone substrates. So, yeah, <coughs> this can be a candidate for such can, uh, harsh conditions as multiple myeloma. Now, protein targeting Hymera targeting NAD plus dependent histone deacetylases. Uh, 
Um, in 2018, there was a study on development of CIRT2 specific compound. That is, uh, they call this compound CIRREAL, like cereal, cereal, CIRREAL. And those uh, are derivatives of thalidomide. Uh, and they thus recruit cerebellone as E3 ubiquitin ligase. And uh, they tested it in HeLa cells, like you know, classical cell line used in cancer biology studies, HeLa cell line. So now next, uh, briefly, uh, present to you degraders for that are non-selective HDAC degraders. Landmark study was published by Fisher Lab. So at Fisher Lab from uh, Dana Farber Institute, they made very, very uh, important contribution and are making, continuing to make very important contribution to this field. And uh, I heard several talks by members of Fisher Lab and uh, the, uh, himself and the, uh, and the scientists working with him, uh, including, uh, I need to mention here, uh, Catherine Donovan. Uh, she, she did very important work on, on this class of molecules and presented it in, in a webinar series. So I, I know about uh, her studies and I learned from her a lot uh, uh, about this subject. Uh, reporting chemoproteomics platform uh, to test pan histone deciduous degraded library. So they established the system, like the methodology, to rigorously test, and which is chemoproteomics platform, to uh, study libraries of compounds. And they carefully examined and discussed all important factors that. Uh, need to be considered while developing and selecting new degraders. And they also propose molecular mechanism, how it all works, uh, to explain, to account for targeted protein degradation and the effect on multi-protein repressor HDAC containing complexes. So, interesting uh, approach applied to uh, here was uh, uh, with PAN inhibitor, PAN HDC inhibitors, non-selective. Yeah? Uh, it was um, a methodology that uh, was also used is a photo affinity tag system. A photo affinity tag uh, binds to target protein. And this binding is interfered by use of uh, inhibitor, like a PAN-HDC inhibitor, uh, in, in protein interaction uh, binding assay. So uh, photoaffinity tag binds to target protein upon cell treatment. And uh, this is followed by U UV light photo cross-linking, lysis, capture, enrichment, release uh, with beads, uh, uh, and the chemical cleavage, and then for detection they use uh, bioluminescence assay, bread assay, as a readout assay of that photoaffinity tag uh, activity, which is binding dependent. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, briefly, briefly uh, mention here other enzymes beyond acetyl transferases, acetyl deacetylases. So of course there are acetyl transferases, heads, which I don't discuss here at all. Like, let's uh, uh, think about uh, uh, possibility that uh, if we want to uh, affect balance of acetylation and deacetylation, of course, it is important that not only deacetylases but also acetyltransferases might be important target. Uh, but I would like here to mention something else. Preventing histone methylation is thought to affect the code of histone modification and enhance effect 
of HTC inhibition. New generation of uh, patented histone modifier uh, agents that are non E3 ligase based degraders. So they are degraders, but they are not based on recruitment of E3 ligase. Instead, they recruit ubiquitin receptor, and that ubiquitin receptor targets substrate directly to proteasome. Uh, and one example of such uh, is a dot, uh, so-called dot L degrader, uh, and it was patented by Dana Farber Cancer Institute, and has activity for. Uh, histone lysine 79 uh, mononmethyl uh, B methyl trimethyl as methyl transferase activity. B functional non E3 like is based degrader links uh, ubiquitin receptor, as I mentioned, and targets to degradation to proteasome. And the uh, Seoli uh, laboratory. Uh, discussed those kinds of compound relatively recently well now it is uh, already uh, more than a year ago but uh, yeah I, I think they paid attention to uh, how important those reagents might be in their journal club series and this is i'm talking about school of life sciences in university of dundee in scotland in the united kingdom now, um, uh, I'm much more interested in molecular mechanisms, less in pharmaceutics, less in pharmacology, uh, bioavailability, and all those things that pharma pharmacologists study. I'm not pharmacologist, and uh, I'm biologist. I'm interested in molecular mechanisms. So le let me enjoy <laughs> considering molecular mechanisms of HDAC degraders and how it works. So it was noticed that uh, HDAC degraders can bind and target either free HDAC proteins or HDAC containing multi-protein complexes. And this is uh, what uh, uh, those who describe that phenomenon call it collateral degradation of other protein within the complex, HDC containing complexes. And this may lead to the loss of chromatin repressive complexes. So, Xiong uh, in two, uh, and colleagues in 2021 proposed uh, two possible mechanisms to account for those uh, effects of collateral degradation. So, one possibility is direct ubiquitination and subsequent degradation of HDC binding partners that are located in proximity of E3 ligase. And second is ubiquitination and subsequent degradation of HDC protein only that leads only, that leads to destabilization of the complex that is then degraded by a proteasome. So those two mechanisms were proposed to explain the effect. In terms of cellular mechanisms, cellular mechanisms uh, for cell biologists like me, much more interesting subject of research, uh, those include effects uh, that could be specific uh, for certain cell types or certain tissue or certain organ specific effects. And those of course depend not only expression of target proteins, we need to consider levels of expression in the target organs uh, and non-target organs for those molecular targets. Now, because of uh, the atlases, molecular atlases available, we have much more knowledge and information access to databases on protein expression. And those atlas uh, databases is fantastic progress. So, uh, need to consider cell type, tissue type, organ specific uh, effects of those compounds. And also, such effects on the cellular level as uh, 
arrest of self differentiation so uh, that self could be either indifferentiated uh, go through differentiation process or not reciprocal regulation of cell cycle progression so uh, regulation of cell cycle progression as i mentioned previously it is senolytic effect so cells fall out of the cell cycle cease to proliferate as a result of action of these drugs cellular this is cellular uh, so it could be effects either inducing cellular senescence or eliminating senescent cells so you need to consider it carefully those two possible opposite effects so senolytic drugs of course eliminate uh, cells that already don't proliferate and the other effect is to induce uh, senescence so make cells fall out from the cell uh, cycle and stop proliferate so there could be either senolytic or seno inducing effects right so those need to be very carefully considered on molecular level hdc products may affect accumulation of reactive oxygen species as i mentioned reactive oxygen species that accumulate uh, over stress responses and uh, those uh, relevant processes include dna damage response and the di disruption of chaperone signaling it is thought that histone acetylation deacetylation regulates the expression of tumor suppressor genes and the activation of tumor suppressor genes lead to cell cycle arrest and apoptosis and it's important that modulation of dna repair and the dna damage response happens uh, over the action of these compounds so they might re regulate modulate response to therapy induced genotoxic stress therapy induced senescence I mentioned those things uh, previously above in the beginning of the talk just mention it here again uh, as uh, I think that it is uh, there is a great promise for future to continue those types of studies with degrader molecules because they need to understand those effects of new generation of degraders on synolysis and uh, inducing the senescence uh, therapy induced senescence so based on those mechanisms of action hdac products may be promising drug candidates with possible applications for treating diseases where hdac inhibitors previously were shown to be effective so because hdc inhibitors affect activity of, uh, of hdc's and hdc degraders affect levels of protein but ultimately they expect comparable biological effect so design and development of product mediated hdc degradation hdc products are designed uh, we need uh, to consider first of all ligands targeting hdc second we need to consider e3 ubiquitin ligase targeting uh, and uh, those include cereblon, VHL, IAP. Those are three most commonly used. Molecular scaffolds. Those is, of course, for chemists, uh, important consideration for uh, organic chemists who develop those uh, type of compounds. Linkers. Chemistry of linkers uh, the, is important consideration various chemistry length branching attachment points all those chemical considerations might affect biological activity key criteria important to consider for developing uh, uh, degraders of uh, histone modifying enzymes first molecules tested uh, need to be considered either those are individual molecules or those are libraries of molecules so that's we start with this second what we call top-down targeting families uh, versus bottom-up approach so 
uh, this is question of selectivity. What we, in designing experiment, what we, what we are trying to target. Target the whole family of enzymes, or we start with individual target, and we see what effects might be. Ligands, E3 ligases, scaffolds, linkers, I mentioned it all above. Uh, all those things are very, very important. And uh, finally, selectivity of degraders, selectivity. So are those uh, uh, non-selective or selective inhibitors? So whatever we know about, uh, whatever we know about in chemical, in pharmaceutical inhibitors of HDACs applies also to degraders. So in terms of assays, uh, several assays I employ to test degrader activity. So how degrader activity is tested experimentally? Um, several types of assays are available and have been established, rigorously tested, measuring levels of target proteins by Western blood, immunoblood. So what uh, we do, we measure intensity of the specific band. I, and uh, we can also look on isoform specific shift because of the modification. There is a shift in molecular weight. I, isoform that is modified has higher molecular weight. There is a shift which is detected on immunoblood. Fluorescent reported based assay, uh, quantitative proteomics, uh, measuring, it is possible to measure protein half-life, measuring global effects on the proteome level using very, very sensitive uh, proteomics uh, methodologies. Um, there are also ubiquitination assay because since uh, the mechanism of action of uh, products is ubiquitination of target protein um, it is uh, feasible and it is what uh, what is what researchers are doing to measure uh, ubiquitination of the enzymes in the ubiquitination assay it is also reasonable to check enzymatic activity of uh, dead cetylases with uh, assays measuring enzymatic activity either in vivo or in vitro and those could be uh, fluorescence-based assays, for example, that are sensitive to uh, cleavage with uh, proteases such as trypsin, and they measure inhibitory effect of the compound on the activity. It's also important to include the controls in those kind types of assay. Well, it is a, a more like a classroom problem, but uh, we need to consider carefully what is a relevant control in this type of experiment. And um, in uh, protein targeted protein degradation experiment, relevant control is using E3 ligase that is inactive. So it, uh, that uh, uh, ligase in which uh, its ligase, E3 ligase activity is eliminated. That, uh, that is a reasonable uh, control. Also, since the degradation goes through the proteasome, uh, we can block activity of the proteasome by using pr proteasome inhibitors, and that would have negative effect on targeted protein degradation. Uh, of course, there are also specific effective inhibitors. Uh, so, if a uh, uh, certain specific density is being tested, we can use in parallel inhibitor in addition to degrader that targets that very same target for uh, testing the effect on density lase activity. Also important to examine effects of HDC degradation on the expression of other proteins. So uh, of course, we start with target protein itself, but if we want to understand biological effects, we want to go beyond the target protein and see how globally 
protein expression changes or transcript expression changes, right? So we need to look on upregulation, downregulation of uh, proteins that happens as a result of that treatment. And uh, this uh, effects uh, uh, can be tested in a modern hemoproteomics experiment using proteomics technology. Other possible effects that can be tested <coughs> uh, are, of course, um, uh, genetic manipulations, such as knockout, and that, that's something that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. HDAC genes can be individually knocked out, and uh, it is possible to uh, use RNAi technology for uh, suppressing expression of the protein or use knockout uh, technology in mice uh, trying to switch off gene uh, either completely or with uh, some uh, regulatory system. <coughs> Uh, uh, considering those effects, it is important to keep in mind uh, that uh, those effects may be time-dependent in terms of uh, time following the treatment. They can be age-dependent, sex-dependent effects can be. So um, uh, to be very rigorous and careful, we need to consider those, and that is indeed relevant age-dependent regulation is relevant factor because certain density raises affect aging. So we need to consider it really carefully uh, in specific uh, applications. Recently, new methods have been developed to study Protax, HDC Protax, and I just mentioned, don't describe of course here, but uh, in Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, um, a group uh, studying chemical proteomics, chemical biology. Uh, it's a Kravat group, a Professor Kravat group. Uh, they developed a global activity-based protein profiling methodology. Uh, use functional proteomics in gel, uh, in gel platform, and it is based on using active site directed probes in whole probe proton profiling, competitive assay with candidate degrader molecules. And as such active site probes label active enzyme, uh, for example, for specific post-translational modification. But don't label inactive inhibitor bound enzyme. And therefore it can be used for discovery of selective inhibitors of enzymatic activity and that applies really well for density, lase, density lases. So, <clears throat> um, just to explain how that technology works, they label active but not inactive enzyme. And then in, in, they use in gel fluorescent scanning and analysis of enzymatic activity. And you can compare a normal versus a normal sample representing normal versus sample representing disease state, uh, control versus inhibitor treatment, uh, degrader treatment. And the label enzyme is identified by affinity purification, mass spectrometry. So they used this system for HDC specific probes. Uh, and it could be accommodated for libraries, for testing libraries, inhibitors, products, treated versus non-treated, etc., etc. So uh, these um, uh, models work well with cell-based models, in cancer animal models, in uh, models with uh, uh, of certain types of modeling, certain types of uh, experimentally. Uh, induced cancer in animals and uh, also in a pathology specimen from patient from uh, specimen uh, tumor specimen tumor tissue specimen obtained uh, by pathologists and surgeons uh, 
There is also tag-free version of the of that system uh, uh, to use in vivo in cells, either in cells or in animals. And there are recent, uh, the, over the decade or more than that, they developed uh, such methodologies and uh, it all was published. It is all in, uh, can be found in their uh, published articles. So when we test HDC degraders, what kind of activity in terms of uh, uh, cellular phenotype we can test? First of all, it is uh, relevant and reasonable to check pre cell proliferation because those compounds have anti-proliferative activity. Uh, in addition to checking cell proliferation and anti-proliferative effect, there could be other effects on the cell, on cell survival, of course, uh, not only proliferation, but survival of the cells. Um, uh, uh, um, important considerations in terms of molecular mechanism that you, you need to understand are off-target effects. So off-target effects include uh, degradation of the other proteins in addition to target proteins by the same, by that very compound that is applied. Also very, very, very important pharmacological consideration are toxicity and adverse effect. Don't get into this subject. Uh, it's not my subject now. Cell line specificity, cell-based assay, yeah, could be, if uh, in the study, uh, researchers test several cell lines, they notice differences in responsiveness depending on the cell line being used, cell type being used. So there are differences between different cell lines in their re biological responses to certain degrader molecules. Uh, of course, classical consideration uh, for using inhibitors is time course experiment. And uh, in this particular case, if we measure degradation of the protein or ubiquitination of the protein, we need to do it in a time course experiment and check how it changes over time after applying inhibitor or degrader. Uh, as I mentioned many times, important consideration is a cell cycle effects, cell effects on the cell cycle. I myself uh, never worked on the cell cycle progression or cell cycle proteins. Uh, there are, of course, celebrities uh, that are world experts in studying cell cycle, molecular mechanisms of cell cycle responses. Uh, I was always just dealing with cell proliferation and cell survival assays. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, biology of the cell cycle progression is very important consideration, as I mentioned in the beginning of this talk. So uh, we need to, when we present the data and compare the data, we need to compare specific scaffolds in being in use in degraders, if we, the, more than one scaffold would be used, uh, uh, ligases that have been used and then compare efficiency of the treatment depending on what ligase was used, including control inactive control of the ligase. Linker chemistry, as I mentioned, um, uh, this is sounds like something uh, insignificant, but it is very important. And the chemists realized um, how important it is. Uh, testing criteria are very well discussed in the articles published, in review articles, uh, in research articles on that subject. About perspectives in developing uh, HDC degraders in the near future. Yeah, here I try to briefly summarize what I think uh, are the key points. Potential future direction could be select HDC degraders based on expression of native E3 ligase in target organ or tissue to enable cell type specific uh, 
targeted protein degradation for more focused therapeutic effect. So if we can develop and use the system based on endogenous E3 ubiquitin ligase, uh, being aware that it is expressing sufficiently high level in target tissue and cell type, that uh, uh, solves the problem of not using expression, overexpression, viral expression, and other expression system that might have toxic and uh, poorly understood effects, and uh, maybe just very toxic. So if we rely on endogenous native level of expression, it is kind of much more natural, healthy uh, approach. Uh, in principle, possible to use data of protein atlas databases, cancer atlas databases, and those are fantastic databases developed by researchers in Sweden and elsewhere, uh, Life Lab, uh, who uh, rigorously tested a huge, huge, huge number of antibodies and tissues and documented and have very comprehensive, uh, regularly updated database uh, where we can find expression levels of endogenous proteins, including E3 ligases and target proteins to be degraded. Like this and this. All for nearly all compounds are working through ubiquitin proteasomal pathway, which is sensitive to proteasome inhibitors. A new generation of compounds uh, is histone modified non E3 ligase based degraders, and they recruit ubiquitin receptor. Also, I mentioned in, in the talk already, uh, the, for example, RPN13, uh, targeting using uh, ubiquitin receptor is promising approach, targets substrate to degradation by proteasome. Um, delivery of a therapeutic compound to target tissue and organ permeability of the cell membranes to given compound, uh, localization of the target protein and, and, and enzyme that is being targeted within the cell, biological effects inside the nucleus, outside the nucleus, in the plasma membrane, in uh, other organelles. Very important consideration, subjects of ongoing cell biology studies. And this is why cell biology is really a uh, very relevant uh, area for this type of investigation. Other questions for future development. Does given degrader target HDC only in the nucleus or in other uh, compon compartments of the cell? Is it feasible to design cell compartment specific degraders because uh, since there are for example if it is being engineered with uh, uh, bio bioengineering technologies there are uh, molecular tags uh, like a zip code targeting protein to certain organelle and those uh, i i try to use it myself with fluorescent protein tags in the past in uh, uh, studies of localization of the protein and secretion pathway. It can be applied in these types of studies as well. Designing uh, cell time, cell compartment specific degraders, trying to understand cell compartment organelle specific effects. Also important consideration is uh, composition of multi-protein complexes that contain specific enzyme, such as deacetylase. What are other subunits of that complex and how they are regulated and what is the dynamic composition of those complexes? And how composition of those complexes changes over time of treatment? How specific or promiscuous is the degrader HDC binding? 
We also emphasize importance of uh, diversity in designing components of the degraders. De yeah, so uh, diversity is here is very important consideration. Due to mechanism of action of HDIC, important, it's worth to mention, targeting non-HDIC modifying enzymes. <coughs> also, the therapeutic epigenetic mechanism, which is a fundamental mainstream mechanism of action, is uh, significantly enhanced by use of combination with demethylating agents, such as azacitidine. And this is based on the fact that uh, observation of HDAC are recruited to protein binding methylated cytosines, preventing both binding events, uh, binding complex to target proteins and inhibiting HDC activity, enhances the effect. So it's possible uh, promising direction for the future development of a new, new generation of drugs. Since HDC inhibitors uh, were successfully combined with other kinase inhibitors, such as Aurora kinase inhibitors, other chemotherapeutic drugs inducing cellular senescence in the future, it is possible to combine those compounds with HDC targeting protax. So whatever was documented about inhibitors can be now tested with promising degraders. So <clears throat> uh, let me, uh, in the end of this talk, uh, give, provide you with a uh, comprehensive reference. I don't uh, list here specific articles, but I think it is very important for those who are being introduced to this research uh, to have glimpse on the fundamental textbooks and the reference books on epigenetics. And those include First of all, uh, textbook called Epigenetics, edited by David Ellis and uh, published by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press. And there were more than one edition of this, <coughs> especially chapters on writers and readers of histonacetylation, on erasers of histonacetylation. Epigenetic determinants of cancer, histone modification in cancer. All these chapters are relevant, and I also mentioned uh, to you the review article kindly provided by Andrew Feinberg on epigenetic modulators, modifiers, and mediators in cancer etiology and progression. Also, very relevant reference on epigenetic regulation in cancer. <coughs> uh, uh, also, among fundamental textbooks uh, relevant are Lewin's genes. Uh, well, I can mention uh, uh, genes 12 edition of many, many, many editions. Generations of students are familiar with Lewin's textbooks. Genes 12, for example, uh, published in 2018. Uh, Ageless Quest, scientists search for genes that prolong youth. Uh, scientific Adventure Memoir, Investigation by Leonard Garente, published in 2002 by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press. <clears throat> uh, very entertaining and useful book uh, written and published by Professor David Sinclair from Harvard about uh, his lab's work and um, his colleagues' contribution. A uh, book uh, called Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. Have a copy of that book here at home and enjoy the book beginning from the beginning to the end. Uh, book, the 
published in 2019. Well, uh, it doesn't harm to read medical student textbook, such as classical uh, textbook for medical students, principles of internal medicine that survived more than 20 editions by now. Uh, review articles, uh, I, I don't go into specific uh, research articles, just mention review articles briefly here. Alessio Siuli, Nicole Trainer, Beginner's Guide to Protac and Targeted Protein Degradation. This was published in online, posted uh, in October 2021. By, and and uh, it, it was uh, published by Portland Press. Uh, Stuart Schreiber published a review article The Rise of Molecular Glues uh, in uh, Cell Press Journal. Uh, Raymond Deshaies, uh, who is a very, very influential researcher in the field of uh, ubiquitination and uh, protein degradation, published uh, uh, with uh, colleagues uh, review harnessing the power of proteolysis for targeted protein inactivation in Cell Press Journal, so also recently. <clears throat> there were more and more other articles published in Nature Structure of Molecular Biology, in uh, other journals and uh, research articles specifically to research articles I don't mention here. The, the only thing that is maybe worth for me to, to mention here is therapy-induced senescence. Because uh, I think it's for, for my own background and res research interest, it's more relevant. There is an article on therapy-induced senescence, Old Friend Becomes the Enemy, published in 2020. And the convergence of therapy-induced senescence and the uh, EMT and multi-step carcinogenesis, cell death discovery, published in 2020. Uh, so, um, yeah, Daniel Rodriguez and colleagues published uh, articles on the histone deacetylases as targets, and so on. I seen Sue, professor from uh, Singapore studies uh, uh, leukocyte adhesion and migration and among other things she's interested in um, non-histone uh, effects of the acetylase inhibitors. Classical, now classical landmark reviews on biology of aging is the genetic of aging by Cynthia J. Kenyon published in Nature. Um, yes, uh, this is a fantastic uh, introduction for those who uh, get introduced to the, to the subject. Shelley Berger and uh, her laboratory uh, contributed significantly and they published a review which considers epigenetic mechanisms in longevity and aging. And I'm talking about review published in 2016 by Shelley Berger epigenetic mechanism on longevity and aging. This is very important uh, publication on that subject. So, uh, Daniel Alancar Rodriguez uh, works with uh, Ni Chongahil and they um, work on, uh, uh, on design and development of protac mediated HDAC degradation. And this is probably next address for those who are interested in this topic. Uh, there is a key laboratory and Durbin laboratory in the United States in Dana Farber Institute. Uh, and the uh, colleagues of Ki, uh, Prof uh, Professor Key. And uh, Daniel Anka Rodriguez working with uh, Triona Conkail uh, on that very subject. So thank you for your attention. Uh, have a wonderful day.